Good morning. We, good morning to all of you, and we welcome you on the stream this morning. Glad to have you here as we're here today to worship the true and living God, and we're so glad that you joined us, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching on the stream. Uh, it's so important for us to gather. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes as we do announcements, uh, but we're just so glad to have you join us today, and we're thankful for everybody who's here in person, and uh, so... Let's open with a word of prayer, and then Cody's going to come, and we're going to sing a song. Let's pray. Good morning, Father. Lord, we thank you so much for your tremendous love for us, and your uh, sacrifice for us, and your living for us now today, and that we can lean on you. Lord, we just thank you for the peace that we can have by trusting in you. And Lord, as we live in a world that is struggling with the virus, with economic issues, with famines, and, and droughts, and and floods, and fires. Lord, we know all around the world there are many people struggling with many things, and governments struggling. And then, Lord, in the middle of that, also the, all those who are affected by this virus and with other illnesses, too. Lord, we pray for our president this morning, and we pray for his uh, recovery from the virus and all those others who are sick. Lord, we pray that his and, and all of our leaders in, in the uh, presidency, in the, in the Congress, and in the courts, that their hearts would be softened towards you and that they would acknowledge you and know you and understand that you love them and allow you to direct their paths. Lord, we just pray for our time together this morning. We pray for our service. We pray that uh, we will have a time of focusing on you and also of connecting with each other, whether it be uh, through the computer screen, TV screen, or here in person. Lord, I thank you and praise you for your great love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. This may be a new song to many of you. Uh, I learned it 20 years ago in InterVarsity, and I feel like we sang it in church back then, uh, but I didn't have a PowerPoint, so it's been a long time. So this is called uh, How High and How Wide, uh, or sometimes How Great Is Your Love, but the, that's not the real title. So uh, UMF is watching as well. UMF, that's right. So we used to sing this at InterVarsity at UMF, so yeah. I got to meet this week, actually, with the UMFers uh, during end of varsity, and that was really cool. Got to see them, and uh, so and they are they are watching each Sunday. So hi to UMF and uh, all the rest of you. So thank you. No eye has seen, and no ear has heard, and no mind has ever conceived. The glorious things that you have prepared for everyone who has believed. You brought us near and you called us your own and made us joint heirs with your Son. How high and how wide, how deep and how long. How sweet and how strong is your love. How lavish your grace. How faithful your ways. How great is your love, O oh Lord. Objects of mercy who should have known wrath were filled with unspeakable joy. Riches of wisdom, unsearchable wealth, and the wonder of knowing your voice. You are our treasure and our great reward, our hope and our glory. How high and how wide, how deep and how long, how sweet and how strong is your love. How lavish your grace, how faithful your ways, how great is your love, O oh Lord. How high and how wide, how deep and how long, how sweet and how strong is your love. How lavish your grace. How faithful your ways. 
How great is your love, O oh Lord. All right. Good singing this morning. So as we go into announcements, I want to again remind you that we are doing the uh, 8 o'clock service now. It is a masks required service. And uh, so especially if you're uh, particularly concerned with staying safe, we are uh, observing obviously social distancing in all our services. And we're recommending masks for both services. But uh, we are doing masks only at the 8 o'clock service. And we've got plenty of room if you would like to come to that service. Just to let you know. But we are not f filled up yet even with our reduced, uh, reduced attendance and spacing. So we'd love to have you join us for that. And again, if we need to create other opportunities, we are happy to do um, additional opportunities and do additional times of gathering. If, if that's required, we'd love to give you the opportunity. We also encourage you to do a gather group and get together. If, I guess the key word these days are pods, where uh, with the schools and different ones, where the basic idea is that you have a cluster of people that you may spend time with, and you're kind of all in the same viral boat as it be. And uh, so if there's other people that you're getting together with or can get together with, and uh, watch the stream together. But then the biggest thing we're doing is we are offering, com uh, we want people to join communities. And communities are more than just gather groups. They're uh, a stronger connection. And we have a video this morning. Oops, I forgot to put that up. So we have a video this morning from Jeremy and Allison who are uh, setting up our, our um, communities. And so here's a little bit of a, a reminder and an encouragement for our communities. There are some things in life you just can't do alone. Like playing volleyball. <music> playing hide and go seek. Scissors. There are some things in life you just can't do alone, and our life journey is one of them. So check out our Beans Corner website to sign up for our community and get connected this fall. Folks, uh, as you can see, some things in life are just uh, better done uh, in groups than uh, by ourselves. So we hope Allie and I entertained you for a few minutes here. Wanted to connect with you uh, to encourage you to get signed up for communities. Over the last six to eight months, we have been all over the place, separated in different parts of the world. And we would really love to see people getting back connected into the church with a community of people who just uh, love and adore you. So uh, please uh, take a look at the website. There are things color-coded. We have had communities that are connected via Zoom. We have communities connecting at church. Uh, we have uh, things organized in such a way to make sure that people are protected, uh, but at the same time, we can commune and we can get together uh, and experience Jesus uh, as, a, as a body of Christ. Uh, hope you are all well in safety. Uh, feel free to contact ourselves or Cody um, or Ira at any time. Thank you very much. Have a great, great day. We'll see you guys soon. Bye. So we hope that you will sign up. That is live on our website, and so you can go. And one of the things that they mentioned, and you'll see this on the website, is as we are working our way through this time in, in our world's life uh, with the virus, we know that not everyone has the same approach 
to uh, even just how we're doing the precautions with wearing masks and distancing and things like that. Some people may have already had the virus, aren't, uh, aren't as vulnerable anymore, or are just not as, as concerned about it either way. I don't know what's, what's making noise here. But, um, so we have three different colors. The idea is, is that as we may have differences in how we are personally approaching uh, safety issues right now, that we do not want those different issues to be divisive um, by trying to eliminate misunderstanding and make sure we're all on the same page. So we've created three colors uh, to help us uh, kind of agree on how different things will work. So the three colors are orange is, uh, I'm not overly concerned about the virus, and uh, orange would be like if, if it's a group of people that you're already spending close time with. Uh, when I'm home with my family, we are orange. We're not distancing from each other. I hug my kids, I hug my wife, I hug my mom. We're, we're not, we don't wear masks in our house. Uh, we don't social distance within our house. We are, we, that's orange, where you're, you're just really not, um, not taking much, much for precautions. Uh, yellow is uh, trying to take precautions. This service is yellow. Uh, right now, I, I have my mask off, but when I was around you closer, I kept my mask on. Uh, so many of you, while you're sitting down, may take the mask off, um, but we are still social distancing and, and using masks, uh, but we're, we're maybe being a little more relaxed about it, but still being careful. And then purple is full masks and full distancing. Our 8 o'clock service is a purple service, um, and it's, it's the maximum protection, maximum care. And uh, so this way, so when you go on the website, each group will have a color, and that way you kind of know what's expected in the group. Well, well is this going to be a group that if you're, if you're in purple mode, then you're going to know, oh, this is a group that I will feel comfortable in because we're all agreeing that we're going to mask and social distance and not, not break those things. And if I'm in a yellow group, I know that we're going to be careful, but... Somebody, sometimes somebody may have a mask off. It won't be as rigid. If I'm in an orange group, I know that somebody may give me a hug. So uh, just it, that, that way everybody can understand and there won't be hopefully misunderstanding and conflict because that is something we are not supposed to have. So we're hoping that this is helpful with that. So all that's on the website. We are still looking for people who are willing to participate. We, want, we need people to sign up, but we also are looking for some community leaders, uh, which uh, does require membership. Um, and we have this Tuesday at 6 o'clock, we are having a training. Uh, the training will be here in this room, but we will, have, uh, we will also be doing it on Zoom. So if you need to attend uh, virtually, uh, that will be available too. So either Zoom or here at 6 o'clock on Tuesday for training for communities. And then that is for also all shepherds. So we'd ask you if you are a shepherd to try to attend that meeting. And uh, we'll have the Zoom link and probably an email to you. Uh, it'll be our regular meeting Zoom link. Cheese. So speaking of groups, Cheese is also uh, gathering again on October 20th, which is Tuesday. That's different than uh, last year. And it's from 1130 to 1 uh, here at the church. And uh, this will be, I uh, think, purple. It's masks required and social distancing, so we'd call this a purple group. Please bring your own lunch and beverage. There will be coffee available. And uh, if you'd like to bring a, a reading, something that you'd like to be meaningful or funny that you'd like to share, uh, feel free to bring that. So that's October 20th, 1130 to 1. And cheese is for uh, anyone 50 or over. And uh, technically, but I'm still, I'm still in denial. Uh, but but it's i am invited i've been they've been inviting me for years because i i looked the part even if i wasn't so so anyway that's tuesday october 20th from 11 30 to 1. so i think that's uh all the announcements we have at this point and uh so we're gonna do a children's message so uh any kids if you want to watch uh we're gonna uh hear from me back home hi guys how are you or what i'd like to say is Hola, como estas? Do you understand? Hola, como estas? You say, I don't know if I understand you. That's Spanish. Now, maybe you speak Spanish, but probably most of you don't. But hola is like our saying hi. Can you do that with me? 
Hola. Hola. When I'm down in the Dominican Republic, you say that a lot. You're walking down the street, you just walk past someone, you say, hola, hola. It's just like we say, hi, hi, hi. It's the same thing. Hola. Now, the other thing I said was, como estas? Como estas? You say, como estas? Como estas? That means, how are you? And so a lot of times when you meet people, again, just walking along, you say, hola, como estas? Can you say that? Hola, como estas? Hola, como estas? Hi, how are you? So see, now you've learned some Spanish. Hola, como estas? I'll teach you one more. You say, muy bien. Muy bien. That means very good. Very good. Muy bien. So, hola, como estas? Muy bien. Hi, how are you? Very good. So now I've taught you a little Spanish. Do you know that somebody had to teach me Spanish because I didn't know how to speak Spanish? And so I've had people who teach me Spanish. And some of my friends down in the Dominican Republic, they have taught me Spanish. Sometimes you also have to learn English. If you are learning how to talk or you're learning to talk more, and then when you learn to write, you probably have teachers or your mom and dad or your aunts and uncles or your grandparents or even a big brother or sister sometimes might be teaching you how to talk, how to you know learn new words, how to write, because someone has to teach you all this stuff, just like I taught you some Spanish if you didn't already know it. Because we need people to teach us that which we don't know. Now, what about knowing God? How are we going to know God? Well, somebody has to teach us. Do you know who teaches us about God? God does. God wanted us to know him. And he didn't just say, well, I hope you figure it out. Because that would be hard. And so God, because he wants us to know him, he actually is teaching us about him. And he teaches us through a couple different things. One, he teaches us through nature. So it's beautiful out here today. And you can see behind me, you can see some of the trees that are changing color. And you can see the beautiful sky. And at night, when it gets dark, the stars will come out. And the Bible says that all of creation, all of the earth and the sky and the, the stars and all that, that they teach us about God. And then he also gave us his word, the Bible, that teaches us even more about him. And then he actually came down as Jesus. And the Bible says Jesus helps explain God because Jesus is God. And so we don't have to try to figure out who God is. We don't have to try to guess because he wants you to know and he'll teach you. And that's why we study God's word. We study the Bible. We memorize the Bible. We read it. That's why we talk to God. And that's why we enjoy creation because God wants you to know him. And so he will teach you. And that's why sometimes we also have grown-ups and others who can help us understand God's word. But in the end, it's God who's going to teach us about him through his word and by getting to know Jesus. So I hope that you, just like I taught you Spanish a little bit, I hope that you will let God teach you about him because he wants you to know him. And so he has been trying to let you know more about him. But we have to listen and we have to be willing to learn. I hope that you are always willing to learn more about God. And I hope that you'll continue to let teachers and let me and your parents and whoever else can help you know God better so that you can know him and be friends with him. And someday we'll all be together with him and then we will know all about him because we'll be with him. So I hope you're having a good, I hope you had a good week. I hope you have another good week. I hope you're having a good day today. I love you. I miss you. Hope to see you soon. Have a good day. Oh, one more Spanish word. Adios means bye-bye. So adios. So see, now you're all ready to be able to come to the Dominican with us. Uh, the next time we go, we don't know whether we'll be going in January or not. Let's uh, be praying for them right now. The last update I had, they were getting really slammed. Uh, the hospital was in overflow, uh, and a lot of our people that we know are sick. 
Uh, they're having a really rough time with the virus down there. And, uh, and it's also tough on them economically because with no groups going down, uh, when we go down, we are an economic engine for them because there are translators and bus drivers and cooks and uh, just the people who take care of us and us coming down, we, we pay uh, for their service and that's, that's their job. And there's around 40 groups that go a year and or 40 different weeks at least that groups are there out of 52. And there's been nobody since March because everything's shut down across the world. And uh, so a lot of them, that's their income gone. And uh, then again, they are, they are um, very sick, many of them in the hospital. Uh, they'd had to, they were creating new isolation rooms. And from what we hear, uh, because the virus is just running so rampant that the hospital is just overwhelmed. And uh, we're, we're in much better shape than so many places, even though we're worse shape than others. So anyway, we're in part two. Our series is need, Needing Hope. And this week, part two, Called to Hope. And just a quick review from last week, we were talking about what do we hope in, and that so often our hopes are wishes, because we're hoping in things that may or may not come true. And I used the example of, of a car, and you're going to go, go on a trip, and you say, well, I hope my car doesn't break down. And that's something I've always had to hope for, because I, I always drive old vehicles. And we talked about the fact that really what you're doing is you, your hope is a wish because you're expressing what you want to have happen, but you know it may not. So that's really a wish. And so there's an uncertainty there because it could disappoint you because, oh, I'm going on, I've got a week off. I'm going on vacation. We're going we're gonna to go on this drive and we're going to go to this place and have a week. And then you get all loaded up and a mile down the road, the car breaks down and it's bad, and you can't, you, now we don't, we missed our flight, we can't make it, and you're disappointed because what you hoped would happen didn't happen. And so then that brings anxiety, and it makes me nervous. And we talked about that biblical hope is not a wish that will lead to worry and lead to disappointment, but, but biblical hope is an uncertainty that leads to life because now I'm not consumed with worry. And we see that so much in our world right now. I hope, I hope that I don't get the virus. I hope I don't get sick. I hope I don't lose my job. I hope that things get better. I hope that so-and-so wins the election. Whatever, we have a lot and we're, we're wishing, we're hoping. When I have my hope in God and God's word and God's promise that won't change, now this allows me to release and not clutch. When I'm, when I'm scared, I've got to try to hold things in. I've got to try to hold on. And when I'm, when I'm not scared, then I can release. I can, I can be free of trying to clutch and hold on to everything. So that's where we've been. So today we're going to talk about being called to hope. And if you'll turn with me, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to just pick three verses here. And then we're going to jump back to Ephesians chapter 1 for a little lengthier passage. But this is Paul, and Paul is writing to the church in Ephesians, and one of the things we need to understand about the church in Ephesians is this, as many of the churches in the empire were, it was mixed. It had both Jews and Gentiles. It was a mixed race church of both Jews and Gentiles, and you're going to see that reflected in what Paul talks about. So here in uh, Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so here's that reflection of the, the Jews had traditionally been God's people and the Gentiles were not. And so how did you know you were God's people? Well, you were a Jew. Now, it wasn't supposed to be that the Gentiles then didn't have any hope. It was the Gentiles were supposed to learn about God from God's people, not how it worked out because the Jews, did, the Jews held it with favoritism rather than reaching out. 
So here he uses this and he says, but really it's not about your race, which was part of the point. It wasn't ever supposed to be about race. It was supposed to be about, do you know God or not? And so here he says, listen, for those of you who didn't, who were Gentiles in the flesh, when it was just about race, and you were outside of the circumcised, the, the, the Jews by race, and then he says, that was, all, that was just the flesh done by humans. But then he says, but the real point is spiritually, that you were separated from God without hope, with no hope without God in the world. You were separated from God, and therefore you didn't have hope in the world. But now in Christ, you've been brought near. With that in mind, now flip back to Ephesians chapter 1. So just back a page. Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 7 through the first half of verse 19. Ephesians 1, 7. In him, Christ, we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that, you may kn- so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and, that, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. We'll stop there. Now, Paul, is a very, Paul was very highly educated. He was very well learned. And uh, so when we read his stuff, sometimes it gets a little dense because Paul, Paul really can write. And when Paul writes, he puts in a lot of descriptions. And, and so like if, we were, if Paul was going to tell you he was going to drive to the store, I might say, I got in the car and I drove to the store. Paul would say, I, Paul, an apostle <clears throat> who has been saved by God, by grace, through his shed blood, am getting into my car, which I bought last month, over at, Steve's, over at Steve's used car lot, Steve, who is great and a brother in Christ, saved by the grace of God, and drove down, observing the speed limit, as in all things we honor God through uh, the submission to authority, to the store where, and that's how Paul writes. So when we're reading him, especially as we translate him into English, it, sometimes we start reading him, and after a few minutes, you're kind of like, well, what did I just read? And so we're going to, let's unpack this a little, because what he says here is important, uh, but because he says it so well and so completely, sometimes it's easy to miss. So let's unpack this a little. Starting in verse 7 and 8, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. So he's talking about getting saved. He's talking about coming to Christ by accepting his sacrifice on the cross. He says it twice, redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our trespasses, Through what? How did we get that? According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. So he poured out grace on us. He lavished us with grace that gives us salvation. That's his first thing. Then verse 9 and 10, he said, Then he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. In other words, he made us know his will, which he was planning with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of time, which means to the end, 
That is, and he says it again, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth. So he says, I'm now going to let you, God has now let us know the plan. The word mystery in the Bible always means something that you didn't know before that is now being revealed. We think of mystery as a, a puzzle I have to solve. But in biblical terms, a mystery is something that you didn't know that now we're telling you. And so here it says, now he has made you to know his will. And that not just now, everything he's going to do up until the end when everything is finished. All things are wrapped up in heaven and on earth in Christ. So he's not just letting you know the plan now. He's letting you know the rest of the plan to the end. That's 9 and 10. In 11, he says, <clears throat> now he's also given you inheritance. So he's given you salvation now, and there's more to come. He's going to give you more. That's what an inheritance is, something you get later that he planned to give you. Then in 13 and 14, he says, and here's what you did with all that. So he has saved you through his grace. He has told you his plan. He's given you inheritance. In him, you also, what did you do? After listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge to our inheritance. So your, your part was then you listened, believed, and then God <coughs> sealed you with the Holy Spirit, which is the pledge or the promise of that future inheritance. That's what it means. For the praise of God's own, to be God's own possession. So there's like God's people, you are now God's people. Like it said before, you used to not be one of God's people. Now you are. To the praise of his glory. By the way, no extra charge for this. Little aside, that phrase, to the praise of his glory, appears three times in this passage. The first time is before uh, verse 7. And each time it appears, it refers to a different member of the Godhead. So the first time it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, it's talking about God, God the Father. The second time, here, it says to the uh, praise of what the God the Son has done. And the third time it appears, it's about talking about the Holy Spirit. So you get the Trinity thrown in there. That's extra, no extra charge. All right, keep it moving. So then, 15 and 16. Then Paul says, I'm really excited about this. For this reason, having heard about this, I give thanks and I pray for you. That's 15 and 16. I give thanks and I pray. And what do I pray for? Verse 17, that he would give you wisdom, the spirit of wisdom, and of the revelation in the knowledge of him. So I pray, I, I'm really thankful that you know this, that you've come to know God, and I pray and give thanks to you and pray that you will learn more about him in wisdom and knowledge of him. Why? Verse 18, so that the eyes of your heart, which just means to understand, may be enlightened, so you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? So that you would understand the hope of everything I've just talked about, of God coming and saving you, of God pouring his riches on you, of God uh, dying for you, that you would know this and that because you knew it and understood it, that's where your hope is, this rich inheritance so that you'll know the hope of his calling, the rich inheritance. And he says in 19, and, that, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? And it goes on, if we were to keep going, it says this power is demonstrated in the fact that he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And so the, the resurrection demonstrates this power. So that's what he's saying. If we were going to sum it up, how would we sum it up? This would might work well. God gave you salvation. He gave you himself. He gives you the plan and the ability to know him and know his work. Now, one of the things we might go, uh-huh, no, oh, all right. Because sometimes we've lost touch of what this would have mean, meant to the Ephesians. And if we think about it, what it ought to mean to us. So he's writing to a church that is growing up in the Roman Empire. This is not an atheistic society. 
In fact, throughout human history, there are very few, if any, atheistic societies. Because God, mankind has always understood the concept of God. They've expressed that concept in very different ways. So you have a lot of different religions. Sometimes God is a lot of gods. There's a pantheon of gods. Sometimes God is a life force or, or, or nature. But this idea that there's this power, that there's this highest power out here, that there's something that we're dealing with, and almost every culture, every culture pretty much has had that, because that is innate to who we are. I was listening to a speaker this last week, and I was talking about that, that even in our culture where we have people who call themselves atheists, but so often when atheists, when it gets really dark, when it gets really bad, they struggle with their atheism. I remember listening years and years ago, listening to, I think it was Fresh Air with Terry Gross. Terry Gross is an interviewer on public radio, <clears throat> very, very liberal, but a very good interviewer, and was talking to a, a, a woman who was an atheist. She was a, very much an atheist, but she had gone through cancer, and it had gotten bad, and for a while there, it was really, really rough. She did end up surviving, but there was a while there that it, it, it was touch and go. And as she was talking, because now she was out of it, and she was, um, I think she'd written a book or whatever, but was talking about her journey through cancer, and she, as she was talking to Terry Gross, one of the things she said was, she goes, I, I have to admit that in the worst moments... Even though I'm an atheist, and I was an atheist, in the worst moments, I prayed. You know, and now she was past it, and she goes, yeah, it's just kind of silly, it's because I was scared, it was, you know, it was a weak moment, and, you know, she, she excused it for emotional and psychological reasons. But that's the feeling of, there's something there. There's something there. But what is it? Without God, we are on our own guessing at the universe with wishes and anxiety. And this is what we're doing. This is who we are as people. Because we're always going, so what is, what's going on? What's going on? And, and, and we, we have this sense that there's someone there. So when it gets really bad, we, we reach out to that something. The higher power or the, the great spirit or the gods or whoever they be. And mankind has done this throughout his whole life because he's been created with a sense that there's something there and he's always reaching for it. And in its darkest moments, even an atheist begins to reach for what's there, what's the reason. And so we don't know. And so what do we do? We guess. And then sometimes we call those guesses hope. But even those guesses, we say, well, I, I hope that I have done the right things. I hope that I've been good enough. I hope that I've fulfilled whatever the great power or the great powers want. I hope I have been what, they, what he or she or they or it needs so that I am on the same page or on the same wavelength, that I am one with whatever the great spirit or the great force is so that I will be one with the universe so that when I die... I'm in the right state or spot. And we hope, we call it hope. But we're guessing because we don't know. And so you run into people who are always going, well, I hope, even if they're not religious, they still hope. But it's a guess. And, and the Romans, the Romans had an established theology. They had the gods. The Roman gods, which were based on the Greek gods. But they had a robust theology of, of how their gods worked. And they had their temples and they had their worship. And this is how you do things. And it was very different from our understanding of God. But again, it was this idea of you kind of hope that you relate to the gods and keep them happy and stay on the same page with them. But it's guesses. You're hoping. But that's why there's always the anxiety of, did I miss one? Or did I get it wrong? Or did I not do everything right? When I, when I get there, will I have done it right? And so then what Paul is saying here, and what the Bible says is revolutionary. And even in this day and age, when people are still, what are they still doing? They're still guessing. I did three funerals this summer. None of them for people from our church. People who didn't have a church. And what are they doing? They're hoping. 
They're hoping. They have a rough idea of what they, I think this, I I think it's this. I hope so. Well, that's anxiety producing. I hope they're in a better place. I think they are. I think they're in a better place now. I hope so. I think that, I hope that. And here it says, instead of that, God has chosen to reveal himself and say, not only am I going to tell you who I am, I'm also going to tell you everything I'm doing. I'm going to tell you the plan. Because what what, what, what the ancient gods, what do you have to do? You, you, you go, to a, go to a seer, read the tea leaves, tr- you know, set, set out a thing and try to figure out. You know, we, we talk about putting out a fleece. The reason Gideon put out a fleece is because he didn't know God. He didn't understand how to talk to God. So he's like, give me a sign, give me a sign. God says, tell you what, I'm going to tell you who I am and I'm going to tell you the plan. You're not going to have to try to guess what I'm up up to, what I'm doing. You're not going to even have to guess what my plan for you is. I'm going to tell you the whole thing right to the end of the age. I'm going to tell you how it ends. I'm going to tell you the whole story. And not just that, I'm not just going to reveal myself to you and I'm not just going to tell you my plan. I'm also, and this is really weird because no other system ever brought this out, I'm going to, as God, give myself to you. Because that's not how any of the gods worked. They're higher. They're the great spirit, the great force, maybe impersonal, or maybe just distant or demanding. And mankind is supposed to give, serve, conform to, And this God says, I, instead of demanding from you, will give myself up for you. That's not what gods do. That's different. Well, maybe God's doing that because you are so good. It says, no, you are undeserved. You are outside. You are excluded. And God, though you did not deserve it, chose to do that. Well, now we're really getting radical. This is so different. And he will provide salvation. That rather than say, here's what you've got to do to get to me, he says, I will give my, I'll do it all. I will offer you salvation. I will bring you into my presence and I'll do it at my expense. And not just my expense of I'll do some weird act. I will actually give up myself. weird how different and that's why we sang that song we sang no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has ever conceived I like to use that phrase it's from the Bible it's from a verse And I like to use it to talk about the future that we haven't seen yet, the the glories that are to come. And it's true that we we don't understand and we haven't conceived of what's to come. But as one of my friends recently pointed out to me, this verse is talking about Jesus. That phrase, no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has ever conceived, is talking about no one ever came up with a God like this. And that's true. True. Because throughout human history, we created gods that we had to serve, not a God that would serve us. We created gods that you tried to keep happy, not a God who said, I will satisfy myself for you at my expense. And I will do the work. And I will tell you my plan. And I'll tell you the whole thing. And I will offer myself to you, as opposed to what did the gods demand? You offer yourself to me. And we have to understand that because too often sometimes we've even taken what we call Christianity and we've turned it into a religion where God is sitting in heaven going, here are the rules and here's what you do. And if you do it right, I'll give you eternal life. And that's not what the word of God says. That's what religious Christianity says. And sometimes we cake it up with a bunch more rituals and ceremonies and say, well, do this and do this and do this. But what he's saying all the way through here is that God has what? Lavished his grace. And grace is what? 
favor that you don't deserve. And he has lavished his grace upon us. He has given you undeserved himself to the praise of his glory. He's given himself. This is radically different. And that's why we have to be careful because too often, even now, there are people who are doing Christianity. But it is not the picture of God that God has given us in his word. It is a pagan God who sits in heaven and demands that you satisfy him. And yet the scriptures say that Jesus came and he is the propitiation. He is the price. And which is why his words on the cross was, it is finished. And we sing the old song, Jesus paid it all. Because the good news and the basis of our hope is not, I hope that I'll do okay. I hope that I'll come through this. God says, no, the basis of your hope is I have done it. I have given it to you and I've already told you how it ends for you. It ends with me because I have vowed on myself that I will take care of you. I will save you and I will satisfy the requirements of being in my presence. And that's what he's saying here. And so then Paul says, so I pray that your eyes, the eyes of your heart would be open that you would understand that. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. A hope that is not a wish, but a hope that is based not on whether you are good enough, but that God has been good enough for you. You have been called to hope. In my own life, I don't know what's going to happen in the next 12 hours. Over the next year, I don't know whether I catch COVID or not. If I catch it, I don't know whether I have a mild case of the sniffles, no symptoms, or end up in the hospital or dead. I don't know. I don't know if on the way home my car breaks down. I don't know if out driving I get hit by the drunk driver. So much I don't know. But I know how my story ends. Why? Because he told me. I know that unless he comes back, I'm going to die. And that that death is going to be super, super temporary. And will be immediately followed by being in the presence of the Lord forever. In joy and in glory and amazement And that that will never, ever, ever, ever be threatened. And that not only that, but all those who have gone ahead and will come behind, who have also accepted that gift, I will be with them forever. We're waiting for that, aren't we, Mom? (laughs) The great reunion. With never another goodbye. Why? How do I know that? Because he already told me. It says because he has chosen to tell me the whole plan. He has revealed the mystery of what his will is. I'm not like, what does God want? God says, I already told you. And I've told you how it ends for you. It ends with me. And so I don't have to be afraid. Whatever happens in the meantime, I know how it ends. Because God has not kept me guessing and I'm not wishing. My future is not a wish. It's sure. But not because I've done the right thing. Because the Bible has been clear. I haven't. None of you have either. All have sinned and fall short. All We, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to our own way. And yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the consequences, the rebellion of us all. And so my hope is not 
I hope I was good enough. I hope I was a good pastor. I hope I was a good dad. I hope I was a good husband. I hope I was a good Christian. Because I already know the answer to all those questions. I'm not particularly good at any of those things. And I will definitely never be good enough. But my hope as the other song we sang, I think, last week or recently, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me. My hope is in something certain, not on me. I am far too uncertain. You have been called to hope. So the only question that we have to deal with is, do you accept? Because different than any other God that man has ever come up with, the God of the universe who has revealed himself through all of creation, through his word, and through his own coming as a man, the man Jesus Christ, who was God. The Bible says no one has seen God at any time, but Jesus, he has explained him to us. Because God didn't say, I'm trying to keep myself a mystery. God says, no, I want you to know me. I'm not hiding in the mist for you to discover. You don't have to wonder about me When Jesus showed up and he starts talking about God, they're like, Jesus, so tell us about the Father. Jesus says, you've seen him. Because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are the same person. We are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You want to know me, I'm right here. Oh, I want to know God. I wish I understood the universe. God says, I'll explain it to you. Will you accept What do I have to do? Accept. I have done all the work. You have been called to hope. As we live through these times, we don't need to fear. I don't worry about next week, nor the next election, nor COVID, because my hope is in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we are bad at this. You told us we're bad at this. Lord, as you had Paul writing to his friends in the Ephesians, he was helping them understand they had been apart. Without hope in the world. Our world is without hope. They They are making guesses. They are wishing. They're hoping that a vaccine or an election or a certain economic formula or a certain amount of political power, or different things will bring peace, will bring stability. And yet, Lord, they're just guessing. They don't know. And so our world is filled today with anxiety and fear. You have told us repeatedly that we should not be afraid because we know you've told us how this ends. You've told us that you are in control and that no matter how evil or rebellious this world gets, that we can stand secure on you because you demonstrated your power by coming, living among us as one of us, dying as one of us, but beating death because you are not human alone. You are God too. And you gave up your godhood long enough to die that we might know you, and through your shed blood you have saved us. If we will simply accept. Lord, help us to stop wishing and fearing and living in anxiety. Help us not to guess about you, but to have the eyes of our hearts open that we would know you that we would read your word because you've told us the whole thing and you have shown us the whole thing and you have shown us yourself and you have demonstrated power beyond this world by beating death. And Lord, may we then shine like lights because we will be filled not with fear but with love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that will cause us to shine like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden and that we will stand apart from this world in ways that catches their attention because no eye has seen and no ear has heard 
And no mind has ever conceived of the glorious things that you have done by sending your son, by coming and living among us, Emmanuel, God with us. And may we be then beacons of hope in a lost and dying world. Free from fear, thank you, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we're going to say, we're going to talk about sticking with hope. Because just because you know it, and just because you've accepted it, doesn't mean it suddenly got easy. It's really hard. How do you stick with this? How do you not get discouraged? How do you not get scared? So next week we're going to talk about how do you stick with it? How do you hold on? So, hope you'll tune in next week. We're going to close with the song, Oldie But a Goodie, How Great Thou Art. Please join us as we sing the song. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior,
God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. That song really talks about how God has revealed himself through nature, through his word, and through his son, Jesus Christ. Through Jesus coming as God, Emmanuel, God with us to live among us. He wants you to know him. He wants you to accept him. He has done all the work. Let us rest our hope in him. Father, thank you that we can have confidence because of your sacrifice, because of your work, your finished work. You have done it. You have revealed yourself. You have told us the whole story to the end. We know how it ends. Lord, as we await the end, Lord, may we put our hope in you. We don't have to wish. We can know. We can have confidence. We can have security and be filled with peace and love and joy and be patient and kind to those who don't know yet and try to reach out to them and let them know the hope that awaits them because they are separated from you without hope in the world. Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you for, in your word, revealing yourself to us, telling us about who you are and why you do what you do and what you are doing. Thank you that you want us to know you as you know us. We pray these things and we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope to see you next week. Again, we'd love to have you at the early service or at this one if you sign up. And hope you have a good day.